This, uh, this, this talk is available at the URL shown on the screen. If you want to follow these slides at your own pace, you're welcome to, uh, welcome to do so. Um, there aren't any major spoilers in the slides. Um, I'll give it a moment to, uh, to take a photo or copy it on the URL if you want. Uh, my name is Taylor Campbell. Uh, I'm a NetBSD developer. I'm on the NetBSD core team, been developing NetBSD for some years now. I work on various things from networking to cryptography to file systems to uh, uh, whatever else needs to be fixed. Um, and uh, for a long time, uh, I was uh, leery of um, hardware authentication tokens for reasons I'll get into uh, a little bit later in the talk. Um, but uh, at some point, uh, my, uh, my past employer insisted that I, I use a FIDO key, and so I looked into it and I realized, wow, this is actually a good design. So I will uh, lead you through um, what motivates it and uh, what makes it different from past hardware crypto tokens and some uh, uh, cool things you can do with them. So um, traditionally, when you want to get into a computer system, you have to give the password. In fact, passwords go back a very long time. Uh, if you wanted to get into the castle, you probably had to, castle here in Coimbra, I bet, you probably had to give the password at the gate, and, uh, and otherwise they wouldn't let you in. They'd probably impale you and put your head on a stake or something. I don't know, whatever medieval people did. Uh, I'm not a medieval historian. I'm, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, well, uh, here's uh, an approximation to an email I received. Um, uh, nominally from the EuroBSDCon organizers. Uh, and you've probably all seen, if you, if you have any, any friends or colleagues or acquaintances who have sent you a Google Docs link to share the Google Doc with you, you've probably seen an email just like this. Um, they, I actually took a, a real email I, I received and modified the from address and, uh, uh, to make it, uh, you know, to, to obscure who it's actually from. But you know, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is very close approximation to a Google Docs email that you might, might receive. Um, so, uh, uh, as you all know, when you get an email with a link in it, the thing you do is you click on the link um, because, well, that's, what, that's, that's actually how you're supposed to do it with Google Docs, with Google Drive sharing. Um, and uh, so I have this link. It's, it's got a EuroBSDCon conference program, and I've got to figure out when my talk is, so i better click on the link. Um, it's not an attachment. I can't just download the attachment and read that. So I click on the link, and uh, I get a Google sign-in page, and I thought it was signed in, but you know, whatever, this, maybe cookies were lost or something, who knows. And so I type in my, uh, my email address, um, and uh, then hit next, and I type in my password, which is obscured by asterisks, so you can't see it. Um, uh, but you know, I type in my, type in my password, and, um, and this, you know, this is, this, this, this is legit. It says Google on it, right? This has Google and welcome, and it, it's, all, it's, all, it's all legit, right? So I type in my password, and I've been fished, because that was not, in fact, a Google Docs link. Um, if you look very closely uh, at the uh, Google, it says https colon slash slash drive dot dot com. And uh, if you look very closely at the URL bar, um, you'll see it says uh, also googie.com. And uh, this, well, this wasn't actually a phishing exercise. What I really did was I took that Google Docs link and I went to real Google Docs sign-in page and I just edited the URL bar before I took the screenshot. Um, but there's nothing to stop a phishing attacker from creating a page that looks just like the Google sign-in page. Um, you can't tell the difference unless you scrutinize the URL bar very closely, which um, I'm sure all of you as security conscious BSD nerds did. Um, so you knew this was coming, this was no surprise to you. Um, well, you probably did because of course I've built up dramatic tension here. But, uh, um, <coughs> so uh, uh, how do we fix this? Well, the traditional uh, approach to getting more security with uh, login systems is two-factor authentication. And with two-factor authentication, um, a password is not enough. You've got to have something, uh, two of three things. You've got to have something you know, uh, something you have, and something you are. Something you, something you know, like a password or, or your security questions, like your mother's maiden name and the social security number of your brother and um, the uh, luggage combination to uh, your, 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 uh, your partner's uh, luggage locks. Uh, these are all things that you might know, and you can put in security questions or passwords or whatever. So when you have um, a physical object, like a USB device, like I have in my hand, well, this is not actually a security thing, but uh, you know, maybe a phone or um, 
uh, a, a key on a keychain or a, a USB device. Um, and, uh, and another option is something that you are, which is a BSD nerd, and that is how you get into the conference. Um, well, <laughs> Oh, uh, well, okay, maybe, maybe that's not a very good authentication system. I, I, I actually walked in here without this badge even, so I, I, uh, but I guess I looked enough like a BSD nerd. Uh, no, uh, something you are, biometrics, uh, like your a retina scan or fingerprints or, or, or what have you. Um, uh, I, I'm not really a fan of biometrics, to be honest, because uh, you, if, if your finger is compromised on a glass, then you can't get a new finger. Uh, that's, 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 uh, but anyway, we, we won't talk about biometrics in this, in this talk. This is all about uh, uh, FIDO. So um, typical 2FA system, two-factor authentication system, um, is you, know, you have access to a phone, and, a, and there's a SIM card in your phone, maybe. Um, and the SIM card has a super secure cryptography on it. Well, maybe not that super secure cryptography. The, the tele telephony network it doesn't have a stellar re reputation in that respect. But you know, it's, let's, let's say. Um, uh, and when you want to log in, you get a secret code sent to your phone, um, and then uh, you copy into the websites. Other, uh, other systems are an authenticator app, which doesn't use the telephony network. There's just an app running on your phone or on your laptop or a little, just a two-line Python program that you run, which is actually what I do. Um, uh, following, usually follow, authenticator app usually means the TOTP standard, which is RFC 6238, uh, building on RFC 20, 4226. Um, it's a very simple protocol, very easy to implement, uh, nothing exciting in there, nothing proprietary, you know, like I said, a few lines of Python. Um, or you might get a push notification to your phone. Anytime you try to log into Google excuse me, Google.com, uh, then you get a pop-up on your phone saying someone is trying to log into Google.com from Coimbra, Portugal. Is that you? And you say yes, of course, because you just want to get your work done. Um, uh, and uh, okay, so how does this, how does this work? Uh, you know, it, it, you see another login page. This is an actual GitHub login page, just from a few minutes ago, in fact. Uh, and after I enter my password, uh, then I have the option to enter an authentication code from uh, my uh, authenticator app, TOTP. Uh, and when I do that, uh, then if this were not a actual GitHub, oh well, in fact, if you look closely, this is not GitHub. This is a uh, GitBub. Um, uh, well, now the, the operator of GitBub uh, has my password and my TOTP code, and they can instantly log into GitHub as me and change my password and change my authenticator apps and so on. Um, uh, it, it might be slightly more difficult. Well, there might be another step involved for, if, uh, for them to actually do that because GitHub is probably going to ask you to enter another TOTP code, but um, it's, it's not that hard for a fisher to, you know, to take advantage of the easily distracted here. Um, you're trying to get something done on a pull request, someone submitted a really annoying patch that they're about to merge and you, you've got to put a review in. You're not thinking about the authentication right now, you're thinking about the, the, the one critical line in that patch that is wrong and you have to fix it. Um, uh, push notifications, I don't have a screenshot of that because I don't use them. Uh, this is left as an exercise for the reader. I'm, some of you probably work at companies that require a Microsoft Authenticator or Duo Authenticator or something. It's, it's a push notification. It's like an obnoxious news alert, but uh, it's for logging into your email. Um, so two-factor phishing, well, th the way that it works is you type in your, a code that's written over SMS and the attacker takes that code and relays it to the legitimate server and logs in as you. Same thing with TOTP codes. And with push, push notifications, well, you try to log in, you're, you try log into a link that you think is github.com, and it's actually gitbub.com. And uh, so you get a notification on your phone that someone is trying to log into github.com, which the attacker actually is doing. And you, you're also trying to do that, you think. And so you say, yes, of course I'm trying to log in here. Um, another approach is that an attacker will just randomly decide to try to log in as you and you'll get a notification, and you know, you know that you're using 2FA, so you don't have to choose a super secure password, and the attacker take, takes advantage of this, and so they run through all the passwords you could be using, and they send you notification after notification, you get really sick of this, you just, yes, go away, just, get, just get it. and then they get in. Um, and this leads to no notification fatigue, and you know, it's similar to warning fatigue, and, um, and that's, 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 that's bad for usability, which is bad for security. 
Now, the main problem here uh, with uh, one-time codes uh, is that um, although they're only good for one use, you're, you're still copying and pasting a secret that's not bound to the actual origin. It's not bound to github.com, uh, and th there's, there's nothing, you know, you can, you can mispaste it into the wrong site. Even if you use a password manager, password managers that are, try to be clever about auto-filling forms, um, that relies on scraping the HTML and looking at it and seeing if it looks like the right to place to put a password and a TOTP code and what have you, and sometimes it doesn't work, and so you might decide, uh, uh, I need to get in here. I just, uh, maybe the website is broken, I changed the HTML and the, the, the copy and paste and the password manager doesn't work anymore, so you copy and paste it yourself, and bam, you've been fished. Um, now, um, when you have, when you want to have a, 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 a um, uh, you know, enhanced security, the, the, the important part is not more security, the important part is managing risks. Uh, so you have to start with a threat model. And realistically, um, the biggest threat for most people and most organizations and most people between them and their money and so on is phishing. Because the thing about phishing is that anyone can send an email and that email can have instructions in it. And that email can, have, can look like it came from somebody else and it's, it's uh, you know, even if you have all the DKIM and all the whatever email, uh, you know, verification systems and, and so on. I, you know, it's it, it still, if it's got instructions in it, it looks sort of plausible, even if it isn't exactly github.com, but gitbub.com, well, you might act on it. Um, and so phishing, it's, there's a very low bar to entry for an adversary. Uh, so uh, if you look at, you know, um, uh, threat reports from like Microsoft or the FBI or something about cybersecurity threats, phishing rates way at the top of, of, of the kinds of threats that, that every organization has to deal with. Um, so the number one threat model is phishing. And really the number two and three threat models because it really is a big, big problem. Um, and the, the barrier to entry is so low. Um, you also have to worry about user fatigue and circumvention. Um, you know, if, if, if your, your security measures are difficult, then people won't wanna, don't want don't to deal with them. Uh, you know, crypto nerds like me, yeah, we're happy to deal with, with weird, elaborate, uh, you know, obscure things, but People who want to get the work done, send an email, edit a document, they don't have time to, to, to mess with, with elaborate security mechanisms, and they're going to find ways around them. Um, and sometimes that means they'll just adopt a different tool from the one that is hidden behind a super, security, su super secure barrier that you have. So uh, 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 an important lesson for security people here, which is that um, you need to be an enabler, not a disabler. Don't get in the way of people. You need to enable people to get their work done and make the user experience easy. Don't let get secu put security barriers in the way. Make systems that people can use that don't need barriers get, get in the way. Uh, then way low at the bottom of uh, these threats is things like hardware theft, laptop theft. And yeah, that is a problem, but it's the barrier to laptop theft or man-in-the-middle attacks in the network or shoulder surfing. It's, it's, it's much higher, it's much, much harder to, to, to pull that off. Um, you know, you have to have physical access for hardware theft or shoulder surfing. You have to have, you know, control of network routing for man-in-the-middle attacks. And yeah, there, there are ways that, um, uh, that, that, that that can happen, but it's, it's phishing is, is, uh, is a, a, a much bigger threat than all of these. So there are some hardware tokens out there like RSA Secure ID. It's like a proprietary version of TOTP. You've got a little dongle, it has a display on it, and, and it has a code, and you type it in, and you get phished because it's not phishing resistant. Um, old YubiKeys, uh, similar thing, but it's a, it presents as a USB keyboard and it just automatically types some text for you into the gitbub.com text field, which you've been fished. And, and then a bunch of um, uh, hardware crypto tokens with following standards with numbers nobody can remember, like PKCS number 11, PKCS number 15, the OpenPGP tokens. And these legacy crypto tokens, there's a huge software stack you have to deal with. You've got to install a bunch of different packages, and they, uh, there's like daemons and libraries and drivers, and, 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 and uh, I put some links in here if you want to you know, follow them for uh, some issues I've had with the um, uh, actual crypto tokens. Like I, I had this, this EPAS 2003 um, uh, from Phytian, and OpenSC couldn't reset the device to initialize it. Uh, it got into some weird state where it was just pr just bricked, and the except uh, there was this proprietary binary blob tool from Phytian you could run to unbrick it. 
Uh, I got someone to reverse engineer. I got a friend to reverse engineer it and uh, figure it out and send a patch. And now you can now you can actually uh, 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 um, uh, reset these devices. But it's it's a big pain. There's like limited number of keys per device uh, that you can put on there, and you have to do have, have special tools like PKCS 11 in it or 15 in it or OpenSC in it or op the GPG dash has card status. I, 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 and and once you do that, you can have like a client certificate, but that is a privacy leak across websites because it presents the same client certificate to all the websites, and that's, that's just a tracking cookie. It says, I'm Taylor Campbell. Yeah, I'm Taylor Campbell. I'm the same person, uh, all these websites. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's bad for usability, bad for privacy. The, the software is brittle. It's hard to work with. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. So enter FIDO. FIDO will protect us from the phishing. Uh, now, I, I should add the caveat that this won't protect all phishing. Phishing of the form, uh, hey, I'm the CEO and I'm at a client engagement. Uh, I got to get to this guy, this, this client a gift card from uh, an Amazon gift card. Can you just send me one? Can't really protect against that. But it can protect against credential phishing where someone takes over your account from copying your password and TOTP key and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to do a live demo. Um, I'm going to uh, actually mess with my own GitHub account. Uh, if I can get the, um, here we go. Let's, uh, my uh, uh, GitHub profile, uh, let's make this much bigger. Okay, so uh, here's my uh, GitHub profile. And um, uh, I have some security keys registered. Um, now a security key is a uh, little USB uh, token, like, like the, this, this, this little black thing. Um, it's got one button on it. It's a USB-A device. Um, it's got one button on it, just a, a touch sensor. Uh, there's, no, there's no other input or output. Um, and uh, I'm going to, uh, I, I have it named in, in here as um, UB4Chain. So let's delete that. And um, uh, oh, that's gotta, I've got to confirm that I, I uh, uh, have access to this. So um, let's confirm, yes, I, I do actually have access to this. So when I want to register this security key to start using it for uh, GitHub login, um, I just say register new security key, and I'll call it the same thing, uh, UB4 chain. It's just a nickname for the device for my own reference so I can keep them straight if I have multiple ones. Um, add that. And GitHub wants to register an account with one of your security keys. So I'll plug it in and tap the button. And that's it. Now it's registered. That's, how, that's all you need to do to set up a FIDO key with a website to log in. Um, then if I, uh, if I log out, um, uh, why is the logout button so far away? All the way there. Here we go. Sign out. Um, yes, I do want to sign out. I'm doing a live demo. Okay, now let's sign back in. Uh, where's the sign in button? Here we go. Sign in. And let's enter my username. Uh, oh, there's the cash password, yeah. Uh, and just, um, Type my password into github.com, excuse me, github.com. Uh, and now, uh, if I want to use this security key, I just hit use security key. And I have this um, USB device, and I tap the button. And that's it. That's the only addition to the entire user experience of sign up and login. You just plug it in, register the security key, tap the button. That's it. Um, I didn't have to install any special tools. Uh, didn't have to configure the device. No device initialization. You get it out of the box, and it just works. Um, uh, so how does it work under the hood? Um, you might wonder what security properties it has. Uh, how does this just button? How does it solve anything? Um, well, uh, the, uh, the server at, say, example.com, when you, when you navigate your browser to example.com, uh, when I, I said register a new security key, uh, the server ran some JavaScript code that asked to make a new credential, and the browser asked me to tap the button to approve, and the device, um, this, this little USB device with a little, little microcontroller on it, um, uh, 
generates uh, what's called a credential ID, just like a, a random 16 to 128 byte string. Depends on the vendor what this string is, but it's a, it's a random string that will identify a key pair. Um, so the device generates a credential ID and a key pair uh, using the, the origin, the website, example.com, as an input, just to, to randomize things uh, uh, a little bit. And the device returns the credential ID and the public key. Uh, which the server stores for later use, for later login. Uh, now, each time you register a, uh, a, a device, uh, each, time, um, uh, each time you use a, new, a, a key, a, a FIDO device uh, to uh, make a new registration, so if I delete it and make a new one, or if I um, uh, uh, go to a different website, uh, the key pairs are all independently generated. Um, so, uh, th and this works because elliptic curve crypto key generation is very cheap. You just have to generate, say, a 32-byte seed and then do one public key operation, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a few hundred thousand cycles maybe, a few tens of thousands of cycles for, for modern things. Um, so under the hood, uh, this is the general protocol flow of what's happening. Then when I will log in, log authentication flow, the server at example.com generates a challenge, uh, sends a challenge and a list of stored credential IDs. Uh, the ones that are all s registered for uh, use in, um, in login for, for my account, and ask the device to please prove that you have one of these credential IDs. Uh, so the browser then asks the user to tap a button to confirm, uh, and the device takes the credential ID and figures out from just the credential ID and, and the website, uh, example.com, what the private key wa was when it generated the key pair. Uh, it does it deterministically, uh, so it always gets the same one each time that it has the same inputs, the same uh, uh, credential ID and the same uh, origin. And then it returns a signature on the challenge, and the server verifies the signature with a stored public key. Um, so it's a fairly simple uh, idea, but it's a little tweak on, on the traditional thing where you just have a long-term public key that you reuse for many purposes. Uh, in this case, there is, there's usually going to be a long-term uh, a long-term seed stored on the, the, on, on the, on the uh, FIDO key uh, that is used to derive keys deterministically with like HMAC or something. And this has some nice properties. Uh, the uh, public key, key pairs are uh, independent for each site, so there's nothing to cr track you across sites using uh, the, uh, the same, the same uh, device. So you only really need one device, or actually best to have two of them, a primary and a backup, but you really only need one to log into many different sites without creating any sort of super cookie to track you across the sites. And you can still use it to log in. You can use it for different purposes. Um, and the sites can't tell, even if they collude behind the scenes, even if, even if Google and Facebook and, and whoever else is colluding behind the scenes, they can't tell if you're using the same device or multiple different devices for the different accounts at different sites. Um, there's no user visible state to manage on this device. Remember, I, I got this device, took it out of the box, plugged it in, and used Firefox with it to set up, set up with, with GitHub. Uh, I didn't have to install a, a you know, PKCS 15 init tool to set it up. I don't have to worry about how many keys are stored here. In fact, we can have an unbounded number of credentials because they're not actually stored on the device. They're derived deterministically each time, the, uh, each time you, have, you, you log in. Um, so the, there's no limitation on storage uh, here. And um, with the traditional hardware crypto tokens, uh, if you use that as your main credential to log into something, well, there's always a chance that uh, you, you know, the, the vendor has been compromised or they've deliberately put a back door and they've, always, they've stored some way to derive all the private keys so the you know, NSA uh, can get at them again. And that is a concern with FIDO keys, but when you use them as a second factor, the back do a backdoor into, say, YubiKey, Yubico is, is not as attractive a target because it, on its own, it's not enough to break in anywhere else. It, it, when it's used as a second factor, that, that mitigates the supply chain attack angle of, of, of hardware tokens. So while that is still potentially a concern, um, uh, there's no longer one party, no single point of failure from the vendor uh, that that could uh, that could break in. You know, they they would have to cl you know they'd have to both break the, have the back door and fish you, uh, or, or or something like that to get your password as well. Um, so it's uh, it's it's um, it presents less of a concern about the uh, vendors of single points of failure. Um, I I should acknowledge that there are some very limited privacy leaks from uh, FIDO keys from FIDO devices. Um, when you register the device. 
uh, the, the server can ask the device, the website can ask the device for an attestation of the manufacturer and batch number for the device. Um, some enterprise deployments will do this if they have, there's like a corporate IT policy that you must use Ubico devices or you must use solo keys devices, you must use nitro key or, or something, there's, you know, they, uh, an approved vendor. Um, but uh, the, um, uh, the standard, and w which, which has an auditing process, there's a standards body, FIDO Alliance, and it has an auditing process, requires that um, the batch number included in the device attestation, uh, I, I think that it has to be, um, it has to narrow it down to no fewer than a thousand different devices or so. Um, and it is up to the browser whether it sends this. In Firefox, you'll, if, if the server asks for this, the browser will ask you, the server is requesting some information that may limit your anonymity. Do you want to send this? And you can say no. And for an enterprise deployment with an IT policy behind it, then it might not work. The server might say, no, I don't want to do this. But you don't have to worry about that for you know, GitHub or Google or, or, or whatever. Um, uh, most sites, th this, is not, this is not relevant. Um, so you can mostly ignore this, just say, no, I don't, don't you know, anonymize me anyway in Firefox. Um, the story is different in Chromium. I think it might automatically pass it through, but that's, um, uh, well, Chromium doesn't run on NetBSD anyway yet, so we, we don't have to worry about that yet. Um, <laughs> No, Chromium is hard, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, what was, what, there's some progress toward it, but it's done. Um, now, on authentication, um, the device may send a count of the number of signatures it has made. Now, in principle, this leads, this, it has provided some fingerprinting information. There's a security motivation for this, which is that this allows a server to detect if a device has been cloned and then shut off access to it. Um, because if the sig signature counter rolls back, then the server knows, oh, this hardware device, which is supposed to be, you know, a, a, a thing that's, you know, baked in epoxy, so if you try to get at it, you'll destroy it and whatever, that somehow someone has cloned it, that would be, that might be bad, and so servers can choose to cut off access. Um, as a result, this, uh, um, uh, this leaks a little tiny bit of information uh, uh, when you use it, but, you know, I this is something where the, um, uh, the server, I if, if two servers want to collude to try to figure out if you're using the same key, they can maybe get some statistical answer about this, but they can't get a definite answer. It's like solving a German tank problem uh, in statistics, where uh, the, 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 um, in World War II, the, the, the British were uh, trying to count how many tanks the, the, the Germans had, and they looked at the serial numbers to figure out, that and looked at the, you know, the from, from captured tanks, uh, and they tried to, you know, you had some statistical analysis to guess what the largest serial number might be based on that. So you, you have to do some statistical uh, analysis to, to even use this information. It, it is a privacy leak, but it's a very limited one compared to like X509 client certificates where you're just saying, oh, I am Taylor Campbell, uh, I'm trying to browse to this website, and it leaves a record of exactly what certificate you're using all the time. Um, finally, a server can tell, like Google.com can tell if you're using the same device for multiple different accounts at that server. Um, so if you, if you're, if you, you know, have a personal Google account and you're um, uh, trying to do something very politically exciting about Google itself that would make Google interested in determining whether, uh, or you're maybe the US federal government that is, uh, is trying to track you, then maybe you should use more than one um, uh, FIDO device for that. Um, but it, nobody, it, servers can't track you across sites, so it's not, it doesn't function as a, a you know, as a, like a super cookie. Um, generally, for users, I recommend that you get uh, two devices, a primary that you keep on like a keychain, or um, you can get these little tiny ones that I have on a string here. This is just like the, a, a USB connector, and that's all that there is here. The, the whole device is stuck under the USB connector. It's this really tiny nano-sized one. There's also USB-C nano-sized ones, and it just, it just fits in the uh, USB port, and it, it sticks out like maybe a millimeter. Uh, and there's a little ring you can use to pull it out if you want, uh, but it's, it's very unobtrusive, and it's just a contact thing. Uh, so you can have one always plugged into your laptop uh, and uh, maybe a backup in a desk somewhere. So if you lose one, no big deal. You can just get a new one, use your backup to log in again and register the new one. Um, there, there is also a protocol in, in development, maybe deployed somewhere. I'm not sure if it's in, in, in hardware for letting one key delegate to another one. Um, but uh, it's, um, I can't say much about that. Um, now, uh, some enterprise deployments also involve pins, and uh, the protocol technically supports it, um, where a device has a pin, you have to type it on your laptop to get access to it. This is not a good system uh, in, in my 
not so humble opinion. Um, pins have a bad user experience. Their limited software support requires special tooling. Also, it makes the vendor, again, a single point of failure in contrast to using a password as one factor and a device as a second factor. If you use a device with a pin, then the device is now a single point of failure from, uh, from vendors. It becomes attractive as a target. Um, but for almost all use of FIDO, unless, again, unless you're in a weird enterprise deployment or you're building your own custom application, you won't encounter pins. Don't, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, if you want to add support in a web application, um, uh, the, you have to just run, uh, use the, the WebAuthn API. Um, uh, this is what it looks like, uh, just a JavaScript function in navigator.credentials create. You pass some parameters. Um, uh, the, there's some, like, there's some magic constant here. This just says, I'm willing to accept an ECDSA uh, key. Um, there's some other parameters here. That, it's it's not that complicated to use once once you have um, you know, once you have a, a, a um, uh, once once you get started using it. Uh, there's there's more options than you need to deal with, but um, this is pretty much all you need. Uh, it, there's a thing in here to exclude credentials, uh, so that if you're to make a user experience a little better, if you um, have already registered a key, you can and someone asks to register a new one, you can say um, okay, don't let them register an existing one. Let them make sure they register a new one, so exclude all the ones they've already registered. Um, and, uh, and it, th that's the mechanism that a server can also use as a, uh, uh, to detect whether you're using the same key for two different accounts. Um, there's more information at webauthn.guide. Um, it's a good place to find resources. Um, similar thing when you want to authenticate, when you want to log in, uh, this is a JavaScript function you, you, you call, and then the, it passes the result onto the server, and the server can verify um, uh, uh, that the uh, credential is good. Um, Here's, uh, uh, yeah, so th there's, there's, there's various libraries in, you know, in C and Golang and in Rust and in JavaScript and in whatever you have for your, your server applications to um, generate the parameters for um, uh, creating and verifying credentials and to actually verify the credentials once you get a signature back from the device. Um, there's more information here on, on, on how to do that. Uh, WebAuthn is the name for the, the web API that is exposed to browsers. FIDO is the name for the, uh, the standard for uh, the physical devices, uh, like this USB key. Um, and you might also hear the older term, U2F, universal second factor. It's basically interchangeable with FIDO, um, just the name, older name for the standard, some older devices. They have some limit, lesser capabilities, but um, uh, for the most part, it's, uh, you don't need to worry about the difference. You see U2F, you see FIDO, you see WebAuthn. Unless you're working with the nitty-gritty details of the protocol and the standards and thing, you can read them as all the same thing. Um, here's a list of sites that support WebAuthn for login, like Google, Facebook, Twitter. Um, some there are a couple of banks. There are some ver you know, various you know, uh, hosting providers. A big list of sites that, that do and don't support uh, WebAuthn uh, that you can use. Um, and it's, uh, it's, there's also a Git repository. If you know a site that supports it, uh, you can submit a pull request uh, to, on GitHub to update that. There's a few of these, but this one is specifically, specifically uh, highlights FIDO, um, WebAuthn. Uh, some other ones just talk about like uh, general 2FA, which is not, not as useful for anti-phishing. So I promised this would be a BSD talk uh, at some point in the abstract, I think. And so let's talk about FIDO on BSD. Uh, well, as you can see, it works on NetBSD out of the box. I didn't have to do anything here. Um, the way that it works is that uh, the, the, main, the main transport that is used between the little, little crypto processor inside this key, inside this, this tiny device here, uh, is USB. Um, and it presents itself as a USB human interface device, which is a little bit funny, but this has the nice property that you don't need any special kernel drivers for it. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so interacting with it is, is very easy. Uh, it's, it just exposes uh, some simple input-output report pipes, um, uh, kind of like the way that if you, um, uh, uh, if you have a, a USB mouse or something, it will present a report as a collection of coordinates of where is the, where is the mouse right now or what direction is the mouse moving in, and you can write an output report to um, uh, make it, I don't know, print something on a screen or something. I, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, this very simple interface. Uh, easy, to, easy to use from user land, um, generally doesn't require privileges because these devices aren't, they aren't exciting like that, you know, a, it's not like a, a, you know, a, a, a printer device where um, you need to make sure that the general user program can't have arbitrary USB access to a USB printer to reconfigure it and control it uh, without privileges. Th these are, these are you know, it's designed for applications to get at 
user interface, and uh, so it's uh, um, the uh, all unprivileged and uh, works very easily out of the box on all operating systems. There are some other transports. Uh, you can get FIDO um, uh, smart cards uh, that's in like a credit card form factor. I have a few. Uh, support isn't as good on BSDs. Um, some of them have NFC, like this little blue one here, if you, and it's probably too far away for you to see, but this little blue one here, it does USB and NFC, so you can use the same thing for your desktop or laptop and for your phone, if your phone has an NFC port. So um, uh, you, don't, you don't even need a, like a USB A to C con converter, you just, you just tap it on your phone and it'll work. Um, there's also Bluetooth. Uh, I don't know if that works on any BSDs. I never tried it, never looked into it. It didn't occur to me until an hour ago to even think about that. Um, but it, 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 I, uh, it you know, might be there. Um. In user land, if you want an application uh, that uh, uh, talks to a device and does signature verification, uh, interacts with it, um, you can use libfido2. It's a C library um, maintained by Ubico, uh, one of the vendors who makes, uh, makes FIDO keys. Um, it supports um, uh, NetBSD, OpenBSD, and FreeBSD out of the box, and Linux, and macOS, and Windows, and stuff. Uh, it's available in package source and in ports, uh, and it's shipped in NetBSD base. Um, so uh, I've built some applications using libfido, um, and, it, and it, it just works. It had, I had to write a, write a backend for, for NetBSD so it would know what device node to talk to and exactly what IO codes to run and how to read and write and, and stuff. But that was, that was fairly easy. It's just a couple hundred lines of C code and easy to maintain, lo low cost. Uh, we'll keep it working. Um, in Firefox, um, uh, there is this Rust crate called Authenticator RS. It's maintained by Mozilla. It serves a function similar to libfido. It talks to the d you know, device nodes in slash dev um, uh, so that Firefox can expose your FIDO device on a USB transport to a website via WebAuthn. Uh, in this case, you act th th in this context, it is important to distinguish the, the, you know, the, the, the client and device side of things from the browser and server side of things, WebAuthn. Um, it's used by Firefox. Uh, it supports NetBSD and FreeBSD out of the box. Um, it nominally has support for OpenBSD. However, when I looked at this a few months ago, I found a bug in the NetBSD code um, that looks like it was also there in FreeBSD and someone else verified, yes, it is also there in FreeBSD. I think it's there in OpenBSD too. I haven't tested. Um, I made a pull request for NetBSD. Uh, that's what the link goes to. Um, I suspect that it needs to happen in OpenBSD too, I, but again, I haven't tested. Uh, I, the maintainer used to be uh, Reik Flöter, and uh, I uh, talked, I sent an email to him about it, but uh, um, I don't know what the state is. It, this might need a new maintainer from OpenBSD. The maintenance burden is pretty low. You have to be able to read and write some Rust code, but it's not very complicated Rust code the, for the back end. Um, and so if someone wants to volunteer to do that, uh, it would be great to get this working on OpenBSD again. Um, there's, uh, feel free to contact me or just look at the pull request and check it out. It's, it's very easy. It's a very simple, simple problem. You can also use FIDO in OpenSSH. Um, you can generate a key just like you would with SSH keygen, but instead of saying dash T ECDSA or dash T ed2519, you say dash T ECDSA SK. And um, then you uh, keep the ID ECDSK SK key private as usual. This is a little bit different from the, from the normal uh, WebAuthn approach uh, where the server uh, keeps a credential ID. Um, the ECDSA SK uh, file contains a credential ID. This is because it's difficult to, it will require a change to the SSH protocol to, to pass a credential ID back over to the uh, client. Um, so anyway, it, it, so it just works like, a, a, like traditional open SSH, key, SSH keys and uh, you put the .pub in the authorized keys file and when you wanna log in, you have to tap the device to authenticate. Um, I should note, you can also use what are called resident keys or discoverable credentials. Um, uh, in that case, you don't need to keep the ID ECDSA SK file, the private, the private key. Uh, it's not actually a private key, it's just a credential ID, but it's, it functions in SSH like a private key. So you don't need to keep that around if you use resident keys or discoverable credentials, but that goes back to the old problems with um, uh, traditional Card or crypto tokens, you know, requires, well, first of all, it requires newer FIDO keys and there's limited storage per device. You have to deal with state management, maybe pins. And it's, I, I'm not a fan of that. It's there if you want it, but it's, 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 uh, I, I would ignore it. 
Uh, also, I should note on some lesser platforms that you know some people use, like Linux or macOS. That all all this stuff works out of the box, um, and so this is not like a BSD specific thing. Um, and a quick rundown of some cool things you can do with Fido that are not uh, WebAuthn. Um, you can store disk encryption keys on it. Well, actually, it's not really storing disk encryption keys, but uh, there's a, a clever protocol you can use to uh, uh, derive disk encryption keys, perhaps, uh, with a FIDO device. You can use, it, you, you can use uh, FIDO to decrypt your disk uh, at, at boot time. Uh, here's a link. Um, uh, I, I wrote that, by the way, and I also wrote another tool to uh, sign messages with, uh, uh, f with FIDO devices because essentially it just makes a signature, the device, and so you, you don't need to use it for WebAuthn. You can also sign arbitrary messages. It has a custom you know, format for the input, so it's not compatible with PGP or X5.9 or something, but you can, um, uh, uh, you can make a tool to do this. Uh, and I, I put some, some nice properties in this, but I, I don't have time to go through that. Um, you can also use OpenSSH to sign arbitrary messages. Um, uh, with SSH keygen command, uh, and uh, th with those you can use keys, key pairs that were generated for FIDO devices. Um, very easy. Uh, you can also use it to send encrypted messages with um, AGE. Uh, and uh, I, I also wrote this, this, I wrote a few of these, I've been messing around with this for a little while, there's some side projects I've, I've been doing, um, but uh, happy to receive input from these, uh, from, from you folks if you're curious about these. Um, I, I mentioned the, in the abstract uh, the, the, the old internet guard dog, Kerberos. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so Kerberos is, is a sort of different thing. It, it's not a replacement for FIDO. It's not a, an earlier version of, of FIDO. It's, it's a way to, to do single sign-on where you type your password once, get tickets that you can then use in other applications to log into your mail, to log into websites and, and whatnot. Um, and traditional Kerberos authentication uses, uh, a single sign-on uses a password to get your SSO tickets. Um, there is some work in progress. Uh, it's not widely deployed or implemented yet, but there's some work in progress to implement uh, FIDO as a 2FA step, a second factor for getting your Kerberos tickets. Um, and uh, I'll be uh, curious to see what happens with that. I'm hoping it'll get deployed. I hope it's a good protocol. I haven't looked at it really, uh, but it's a thing that is out there. And, and so uh, maybe you'll be able to um, uh, use FIDO to prevent phishing of Kerberos tickets as well, or for Kerberos passwords. And um, <coughs> I think I'm out of time uh, for blathering at you, but if you folks have any questions, then I'd be happy to, uh, happy to take them. Uh, yes, Benny. The question is, can you use a FIDO device as a second factor to logging into your machine locally, I assume? Yeah. Um, and the answer is yes, there is a PAM module called PAM U2F. Uh, this is from the days when it, before FIDO was called FIDO, when it was called U2F. And uh, that is uh, built in uh, to NetBSD base out of the box. Um, you just have to turn it on in the relevant PAM configuration file for the service that you want, uh, you know, like a local dis display manager or something. Uh, and then um, create a file with, um, there's, a, there's a tool called PAM U2F config that will, that will create a registration. Um, to uh, to be able to plug in, so yes, you can you can do it out of the box in NetBSD. I'm not sure about FreeBSD, OpenBSD. Uh, OpenBSD doesn't do PAM, if I recall correctly, so uh, it would have to be something else. But um, maybe it'll work in FreeBSD too. I think it might be in ports. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but it's it's very simple program. It's it should should be easy to adapt if if you want to do that. Other questions? Yes, all the way in the back. I can't see who you are. Yes, the question is, what is it needed about a YubiKey to or, or a FIDO key uh, to make it work? And if you reset it, is it like a different key now? And the answer is, um, it varies from vendor to vendor, but most of the time, what the way that it will work is that um, uh, there is a long-term uh, seed secret key on a device, like a 32-byte HMAC key, HMAC SHA-256 key or something, and a random number generator on the device. And the firmware on the device will um, uh, generate a credential ID at random, or maybe, maybe generate a, a, an HMAC input at random, and um, uh, feed that through HMAC under the secret key to produce like key other key, you know, public key material, pr produce key pairs um, and uh, credential IDs and, and, and whatnot. If you reset the device, and there are, there's, a, there's a tool you can use to do this, there's a, uh, 
I'm not sure you can do it in the FIDO protocol, but with like YubiKeys, you can is in, is a tool that will reset the device, um, and with solo keys and and, and so on. Um, and if you do that, that just erases or re regenerates the secret key. So all credentials you've created with it will be lost, and it functions as a totally new key, uh, and it will no longer work to log into any site that you had registered before. Um, so if you want to you want to ditch your key, then then yeah, you can just just do that, and it'll boom gone. Other questions? Oh, oh, um, hey, I have a question for uh, any organizers in this room. Um, do you know if we're doing the, the, the uh, auction at the end of the uh, uh, event? Uh, oh, right, okay. Right. Don't know, okay, all right. Yes, there is an auction? Okay, great. Um, okay, so I, I, I uh, I, I kind of want to, uh, I don't know if I, I'm, this, is, this is wrong, but I, I kind of want to, uh, uh, I have a couple of devices here that I, I want to auction off and contribute to that auction, but this seems like a more appropriate venue than, than uh, uh, the, the random, the, 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 the usual thing. I don't, should, I, should I hold off or should I do it now? Uh, sorry, I'm looking at you because you look like an organizer, but I didn't realize you're not. <laughs> All right, so so here's here's a uh, a Ubico security key. It's just USB A, not uh, NFC, but it's it, it it works. It's a FIDO key. It works great. So does anyone want to bid on on this uh, Ubico security key? Next is next. What was that? Next. What's next? The auction. the auction. Okay, should I hold off until then? I'll okay, all right, I'll, I'll wait. But there, there there will be there will be there will be a couple of FIDO keys at, at, at this auction. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. <laughs>